Partnership operations and formation, problem three. So we have X, Y, and Z. They form a partnership. Now X is a corporation with a July 31st fiscal year end. Y is a corporation with a January 31st fiscal year end. And Z is a calendar year individual. So Z has a 1231 year end. The question's asking, what is the partnership's required taxable year end? If the partner's share of profits, losses, and capital are in the following alternative pro proportions. And I give you two situations with variations on ownership, and then C is a special situation. All right. So we're looking for the partnership year end. Again, we know it's the partnership problem. And remember that partnerships, we look at the 700s. In code section 706, we have the partnership year end determination. And this is a waterfall rule. We've seen waterfall rules in other topics, like in corporate tax, we saw it for distributions, and we're going to see another waterfall rule for partnership um, distributions. Waterfall rule just means, hey, just like a waterfall, you've got different levels, right? Picture a little boat going down the waterfall. It might get stuck on one of the levels. So you're at the top of the waterfall. You go down one level. You might get stuck in that level. If you don't get stuck at that level, you go down the second level. You don't get stuck there, you go down to the third, which is the bottom or, you know, of the river, or the lake, whatever. Same thing, a waterfall provision. We're going to have three levels here, one, two, and three. The first level is called the majority partner test. So you basically, in a waterfall rule, you test, do you meet the criteria? If you meet the criteria, you stop and you apply that rule. If you don't meet the criteria, you continue on. So the first test is called majority partner test. If more than 50% of the owners of the partnership, capital and profits, have the same year end, you use that year end. If that doesn't work, you go to the second, the second test. The second test is called the principal partner test. It says that you look at all partners that own 5% or more of capital or profits, so in A, it's capital and profits. B is capital or profits. If all of them have the same year end, 5% or more, all partners owning 5% or more of capital or profits have the same year end, you use that year end. This test is quite rare, but it does happen occasionally. Finally, the third level of the waterfall is called least, let me rewrite that, least aggregate deferral. And what this test does is it looks at all possible year ends and it tests the partners a weighted average approach based on weighted average ownership and it sees which year end will give the least amount of deferral looking at the months. Okay. So we've got A and B to consider. So let's start with A. Okay. We've got 60% owned by X, 20% owned by Y, and 20% owned by Z. So X has a July 31st year end, Y has a January 31st year end, and Z has a 1231 year end. So they all, all three have different year ends. So we can't lump together. But if, if two owners, let's say X and Y both had the same year end, you would lump them together for all these tests. But they don't. They all have three separate year ends. So we're going down our waterfall in A. We start the majority partner test, which again we ask, 50% or more of capital and profits, which they all have capital and profits here, right? Because their ownership is profits, losses, and capital. Does any partner in the partnership or partners owning 50% or I'm sorry, more than, not 50% or more, more than 50% have the same year end? And the answer in A is yes, because X owns 60%, which is more than 50%. So in A... The majority partner test applies, and in A, the year end is going to be 731. It's going to be whatever um, X's year end is. So again, A, the principal, I'm sorry, majority partner test applies. We stop there, and we apply that rule, and the answer is 731 is a required year end. Let's go to B. In B, X owns 50%, Y owns 30%, and Z owns 20%. So we go down our waterfall. Do we meet the majority partner test? No, because no partner or partners 
more owning more than 50% have the same year end. Now, X owns 50%, but it has to be more than 50%. So next, we go down to the next level of the waterfall, principal partner tests. Looking at all partners that own 5% or more of capital or profits, do they have the same year end? Well, all three partners are principal partners, right? Because they all own 5% or more. Guess what? They all have different year ends. They have to have the same year end for this test to apply. So the, te the second test fails as well. So that means it's going to be least aggregate deferral because this one always works. Okay, so let's talk about least aggregate deferral. So least aggregate deferral, we're going to have to set up a table, and we're going to test each year rent. We're going to test 731, 131, and 1231 to see which of these provides the least amount of deferral when you look at the number of months of deferral. So we're going to go ahead and set those up, 731, 131, and 1231. And we also want to put each owner, so we have X, and I like to put their year end, so that's 731. We have Y, Y is 131, and we have Z, Z is 1231. Now, <clears throat> below each partner, you want to put their ownership percentage. So we're doing B, not A. So in B, X owns 50%. So do that for each possible year end. Y owns 30%. And Z owns 20%. So we need that for each possible year end. Then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply it by the number of months of deferral. And then we're going to add that to Y's portion, and it's a weighted average approach, as you can see. And then we're going to add those two numbers to Z. And we will get the number of months on average, weighted average of deferral, and we'll use we'll pick the, the smallest number. And that will be our required year end. So let's go through and test each year end, starting with July 31st. So this is what's going on. We're looking at a possible year end of the partnership. We're saying, hey, if July 31st is the year end of the partnership, how many months of deferral would that provide each partner, starting in line of X, then Y, then Z? So here's the issue. X's year end is July 31st. That means that X reports information that happens from August 1st to July 31st. So for X, in a July 31st year end, there's no months of deferral because when the partnership reports its information on its K-1 that sends out to X, guess what? X is going to immediately report on its tax return, which ended that same time. So that's going to be zero months of deferral. For Y, Y has a July 31st year end. Sorry, January 31st year end. Sorry, I keep getting mixed up. Y has a January 31st year end. So that means that Y goes from February 1st to January 31st. That's the year end. So during that period of time, July 31st happens. Now July 31st, which falls somewhat in the middle of Y's year end, the partnership reports its information. That means that because it falls in the middle, it's not going to get reported on Y's tax return until the end of that year for Y, which is the following January 31st. So that's what we call deferral. You basically count it out. You say, okay, we have a July 31st year end for the partnership. How many months of deferral? When would it actually get reported on Y's um, year end return? Well, it's going to get reported on January 31st of the next year. So we go August, September, October, November, December, January, six months of deferral. So you count from the possible year-end date to that partner's year-end date. You count that direction. We do the same thing with Z. July 31st to December 31st, August, September, October, November, December, five. Okay, then we multiply out these numbers and add them together, like a weighted average calculation. X, of course, is zero, because anything times zero is zero. 
Y is 1.8, and Z is 1. So July 31st creates 2.8 months of deferral on average. Now we do January 31st. So X has a July 31st year, and so we count from January 31st until July 31st. February, March, April, May, June, July, it's six months. Then we go to Y. Y is 131, 131. There's no months of deferral. And then Z is 1231. That's going to be from 131 to 1231. is going to be 11 months of deferral. So we add these numbers up. We got 3 for X, 0 for Y, and 2.2 for Z. We get 5.2 average months of deferral. Weighted average. Then we got 1231. So this one's the easiest because you can just count right to the number of months. So from 1231, end of the year, till July 31st, that's seven months. Y is 131, so that's one month. And then Z, of course, is zero. So we got 3.5 for X, 0.3 for Y, and zero, that's 3.8. We've done our analysis in terms of calculation. Now it's called least aggregate deferral, so you pick the smallest. Therefore, under least aggregate deferral, 4B, the answer is 731 is the year end. All right. So now we can look at C. And C, before we look at C, note something. In A, we have a July 31st year end because we have the majority partner test. In B, we have a July 31st year end because the least aggregate deferral test. And yes, the percentages change. But same year ends for the partners, just the ownership change. That's the only thing that changed. So in C, what if in A or B, either one, either A or B, where again, it's going to be required year end under Section 706 of July 31st. What if in um, C, the business involved is a, uh, a business that files tax returns? So a prepare, tax return, tax return preparer. Most tax return preparers do most of their work at the beginning of the year. January, February, March, April for the April 15th filing deadline. Now some tax preparers, like the big four and other large accounting firms, they do more of their tax work during the extension season, so July, August, September, October. But most tax preparers out there do their tax work January, February, March, April. So the question here is really asking, Yes, we know we have a 731 year end in A and B. Is there any way we can get out of the 731 year end? And if so, would the partners prefer that year end? And the answer is yes. So there's a few different rules you can try to get here to elect. The one that's, that jumps out is the natural business year end rule. And what this says is that if you're trying to pick another year end, let's say we pick April 30th. The question is, the year end you're trying to choose, if greater than or equal to 25% of gross receipts during the year occur in those last two months, of your possible year end, you can elect a different that possible that year end. So, for example, with April 30th, right, most of the business that that occurs in a tax business, right, we've got April 30th. Most of it occurs here. So the question is, do you think that 25% or more of gross receipts will occur in March and April, and the answer is yes for a tax return business. So there's other types of business where this applies too, like, like, right, like winter skiing, Halloween, right, because they do a lot of their business in a few months. So they can, while the required year end is 731, they can elect 430, April 30th. Now the next question, we, the answer to that is yes, they can elect a 430 year end, or maybe even another one. April 30, I'm sorry, um, March 31st, maybe even February, because the question is January, February, 
or uh, February, March, if you're looking at that year end. So the question now is, okay, let's say they want to do a 430. We're not going to consider the other year ends, you know, the March or the February. Is it better for them to be a 430 year end than a July 31st year end? Well, considering one of the themes in tax is income, taxpayers like to defer as long as possible, right? The ta paying tax on income as long as possible and accelerate deductions. Most taxpayers out there have income, taxable income. Not all, but most. Or we usually make that assumption when it comes to tax decision making. Or at least we hope they're going to have taxable income, right? We hope they're making money. Um, so July 31st versus April 30th, which one provides more deferral overall? I mean, you could go through and test it if you wanted to, or you could just simply see, hey, look, for X, X would have not zero, because that's what under July 31st is. X would get, you're testing 430, May, June, July, three months of deferral. Y would get a lot of months, because you would go April all the way to January 31st of next year. And then, um, that's Y. And then Z would be December 31st, so that would be a lot of deferral as well. So April 30th would work out best rather than July 31st for the taxpayers. So it would be a better decision to pick an April 30th year end. All right, so that really finishes up this problem.